Kimberly Morrison is here to share with us about connecting to the heart of Boston. So a few fun facts about Kimberly. So she is a church planner. She planted an abbey, which is super cool. She's Canadian and she lived in a photocopy room of a church for three years while taking care of the homeless. So welcome, Kimberly. Well, thank you, Esme. Thank you for introducing me so kindly. And uh, thank you for having me here. Uh, what a great opportunity to meet with people in the city. I've only been in your city for six weeks, so you're all going to have to become my best friends because I don't have friends yet. But having said that, <laughs> I was asked tonight to talk about the city, which is a passion of mine. And so in thinking about the city, I thought, what would I want to share if I was going to talk about the city to folks who are just beginning their uh, educational career, figuring out vocation, and going to live in a city perhaps for the first time but on their own. Uh, and probably from here going to live in cities, maybe not a city you're even familiar with. And so I wanted to talk about the city from the perspective of how do we make the city a home for God? How do we make the city a home for God? And I want to talk about the spiritual practices that would do this. So when you think about the word city, we probably each have our own mental image of a city or perhaps just part of a city. Uh, and each of you might have a different symbol. Maybe it's tenement buildings or a beautiful skyline like the skyline of Boston or an alley filled with unhoused persons or an in city park. We each have at least one image and perhaps more that immediately pop into our head when we say the word city. In the scriptures, especially in the New Testament, there is also an image that is dominant. Revelation 21 says this, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with humankind. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. Well, here in this text, the city is compared to a home. The city is the dwelling place of the human race, but it's also the dwelling place of God. And by dwelling place, the text actually means home. There's this sense of belonging where it says they will be his people. And not only do we belong to God, but God belongs to us. God himself will be with them as their God. So the final destiny of the human race is not a garden like where we started. It's actually a city that is the home of God and our home. But the question is, when we say this word home, what do we mean by home? Because not everyone has a good history with home. Well, um, when I am at home, I think there's three important parts about home. The first thing is resonance. Resonance is kind of like when everything in a certain place speaks to me or has the potential to speak to me. So for instance, if I hear steps approaching me, I may begin to smile or frown, depending on those steps. When I hear my husband's steps, I start to smile because I know he's probably bringing me something to eat or a cup of tea. And that is resonance. I know who is coming and I have a deep sense of familiarity and interconnection with him. So this leads to the second point, which is strong attachment. When you're at home, not only is there a resonance, but you've got a strong attachment to others. We bond to the things in our home. And if they disappear, we feel like diminished. Fear of that loss actually means that we're always trying to care for things and other people. And that's actually a function of attachment. And then the other thing about home is it requires mutuality. That resonance thing and attachment if they're just one-sided and I'm doing it all the time, then we're just cohabiting, but we're not actually at home. I cannot feel properly at home if you don't feel at home with me. So thinking those things through, home is a very important environment. And when God talks about our future dwelling being a city that is home, those are the sorts of things that God's talking about. Remember, it's homes that we welcome infants into. It's homes where we actually flourish. 
Ernst Bloch, you may be required to read this book at some point, or maybe you already have been, wrote a book called The Principle of Hope. And he made this very profound statement in the very last sentence of the book. He says, there arises in the world something which shines in the childhood of all, but which no one has yet been to, home or homeland. There arises in the world something which shines in the childhood of all. We always want to go back to some place, some hug, some maternal embrace, possibly some grandmother, some caregiver, and that moment when we felt loved and cared for. The idea of home, however, might not be the idea that you have when you think about Boston, at least not home that is a place of this resonance and strong attachments and mutuality. As a matter of fact, homelessness is more what many cities in the West are more about than maybe home these days. We've got 70 million refugees that are scattered around from their homes, often to other homes. We've got thousands of people who are unhoused in all the major American cities. We have many people who feel homeless in the very place they call home because they don't have deep attachments there. And then the planet is actually supposed to be the home, the only home right now of the human race. And it's been degraded often due to what we do in cities. So why do cities not feel like home, but actually feel like homelessness? And why would God use the image of home to tell us about the city and to tell us about the future of humankind? Well, let's do the first question. First, why do cities not represent home to us right now? Well, I'm going to suggest there's maybe five reasons why home isn't the word for city. And I'm also going to suggest a way that we as Christians begin to make our city a home for God and each other. So first of all, there's this individual autonomy thing. We imagine that we are sovereign individuals. And although we live in cities where our lives are completely interconnected and we need each other, if we believe we're kind of sovereign in our autonomy, then we don't need to adjust our life to other people. They need to adjust to us. And instead, we can choose to other people who are different from us. To feel at home, you have to feel at home together. So how do you give up sovereign autonomy? which is what our culture continually tells us to embrace, to serve the needs of others. Well, Jesus said, if anyone wants to be my disciple, they have to take up their cross and follow me, even into the city. Second, there's this thing which I know you're very aware of called objectification. In modern science, all entities appear as things. So we reduce people in the city to becoming things just this web of causal relations. Bruno Latour said this, the sciences grasp all things as if they're far away, as if they're external to the social world and completely indifferent to human concerns. And modern technology does the same thing to people. Technology is a tool and the person who uses it is a user, a thing to be manipulated and to manipulate technology. So now this does not suggest that science or technology are bad for all you STEM people out there. They are just powerful ways of relating cognitively and practically, but they reduce us to things, not relations between human beings that share a home. So how do we cease objectifying each other? Well, Jesus says, love your neighbor as yourself. We're gonna get into practices in a few minutes. The third thing about why home may have been eaten away by modernity's ideas is struggle. When we live in a competitive environment, especially as a student, struggling for recognition becomes a search for identity in winning and achieving. In modernity, recognition comes about in highly competitive contexts. Economic success and recognition success are kind of tangled all up. If you don't get recognition in school, it'll be harder for you to get a job and to make the money that you are told you absolutely have to have. And so our place, cities are places not of mutuality and safety, but dissonance and struggle and insecurity. And Jesus said, truly, I say to you, unless you turn and become like children, you will never enter the kingdom of heaven. 
whoever humbles himself like this child is the greatest in the kingdom of heaven. Then fourth, there's this thing that is often referred to as the logic of escalation. So what does that mean? While probably the biggest defining characteristic of us as modern individuals in this society is that we only feel good about ourselves if we're always increasing upward. And I don't mean with our morals. So think about someone riding a bike. If you don't pedal on a bike and you take your feet off the ground, you're going to fall over. <laughs> uh, you have to pedal fast enough so you don't fall off the bike. Life can feel like that sometimes. It can feel like you're never good enough and you're never having enough unless you pedal as hard as you can because you need to survive in a runaway world. And this happens in two ways. First, there's an acceleration of the pace of your life. You feel like you need to study all the time, work all the time, get better grades, improve your skills, renew your software, make sure you're uh, on enough social media. You need to meet with friends and family, take care of your body. And there seems to be just this constant need for time to be expended and time gets smaller and smaller. And then also there's this scope of engagement. You're supposed to expand your reach, have more people interested in your ideas, get more influence with your professors, with other students, with tutors. And as you go into a job, you're gonna be expected to expand your influence. But a sense of home takes two things, time and presence. And these commodities are not available in most cities. What about your time? and presence. Jesus tells us that we should remember the Sabbath day and we should rest. And the last thing in the city that will make us not feel like we're at home is finally a loss of transcendence. We live in post-secular cities. Home has been lost with the death of God. And Jesus said, do not let your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many rooms. If it were not so, I would have go, told you, I go to prepare a place, a home for you. So then our cities do not feel at home due to sovereign autonomy, objectification, the overriding concept of struggle, this logic of escalation and the loss of transcendence. So how do you, as a believer and follower of Jesus, respond to cities that can be corrosive, that can be breaking you down? How do we respond to cities that just don't feel like home? How do we respond to cities full of homelessness? Well, you know what? Jesus is the exact image of what it looks like for God's home to come to earth. So what does he look like? Well, I think the best way of answering this is just to reference the occasion when his cousin John is in jail and he sends his disciples and says, hey, I'm really kind of concerned. Is he really the Messiah? Like, is this what the Messiah is supposed to look like? The Messiah is supposed to restore our homeland. How is he doing that? Jesus gave an answer that was both about embodied practices he was doing and words. He said this, and this is what happened. In the hour they came to ask, he healed many people of diseases, plagues, and evil spirits. And on many who were blind, he bestowed sight. And he answered them, go and tell John what you have seen and heard. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, lepers are cleansed, and the deaf hear, the dead are raised up, and the poor have good news preached to them. You see, what Jesus was doing is what we all need to do. He was bringing heaven close. And actually, he was bringing the future reality of a city whose dwelling place is God into the present. We are people who bring the future into the now. And that's the role of every believer, to bring heaven close. We bring the future into the present by participating in actions that are exactly the way life would be if this was the home of God. In his embodiment or incarnation as Jesus of Nazareth, a human person, Jesus showed us how to be home and how to make others at home in this world. So here's your practices to think about and take home. 
so that you can love the city and make a home for God in this city, make a home for others in this city and actually be at home in this city. I covered these, so I'm just going to go over them. One, take up your cross and follow Jesus into the city among the suffering and the sorrowing who are without homes, whether they're refugees or new immigrants or undocumented persons. They don't feel at home in their home or they're helping out with environmental issues. There are uh, many food pantries. There are homeless ministries where you can get involved in the embodied practices of bringing heaven close. Second, love your neighbor as yourself. Jesus, when he loves his neighbor as himself, is about doing things. It's not just a thought process. You know, the side of Jesus when he died was cut open and water and blood rushed out. And the ancient church used to call that the womb of the church. The place where the church was born was the riven, open side of Jesus. And so the question when we say we're going to love our neighbor as ourself, the way Jesus loved us is, what spaces do you need to open up in your life to bring people home? Who are the students who are left aside? Who are the students who are not popular? Who are those people who need you to open up your side and bring them in? Then third, the third thing we heard about earlier was become like a little child. If we want our city to be a home for God and others and a place where we feel at home, we need to learn to listen to others. Find out why the city does not feel like home to them and ask Jesus to help you know how to bring heaven close to individuals. You know, a lot of people talk about issues in the city and they like to be social justice warriors on Facebook or on other social media, texting. Having been in the front lines, I want to tell you, social justice warriors have no value um, in the kingdom. <laughs> I'll tell you where the work is done, one person at a time, listening to their stories, hearing them and loving them, wanting heaven to come close. Then fourth, and we mentioned this before, rest. Rest from all the politics of recognition. Rest in your home who is God. He finds you altogether lovely. Do not get into the struggle that the city would push you into. Take your Sabbath and invite other people to rest with you. Invite them to know the God for whom life is gift, not the result of a competitive struggle. Life is gift. And then the final practice, do not let your heart be troubled in these dark and difficult days. God has already made a home for you. Jesus replied, all who love me will do what I say. My father will love them and we will come and make our home with each of them. We make a dwelling place and a home for God in our city when we participate in the practices that bring heaven close. Amen.